humble king. It's almost an oxymoron, or seems to be. It's, it, you know, to put those two words together, humble and king, doesn't always seem to fit. Uh, there, there was a, a song we sang at Lachlan this morning, it has the, the, the line, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. And I thought, that's similar. Lowly pomp? <laughs> pomp is, you know, pomp is grandiosity with, you know, lots of fl- flash and floweriness and, and, you know, fancy costumes and all that. It doesn't sound very humble, but, but Jesus rode in this little parade here in lowly pomp, so humble pomp. Um, so just, just to compare him with the usual kings, especially the king of his day, let's take a look at him for a second. We, ha- we have, that's not him actually. It's a, a bust, a sculpt, if you will, of Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, who was Caesar, who was the emperor in the days of Jesus. So he was, he was big king, king over many kings. In fact, he liked to be called that, king of kings. So it's interesting that the Bible uh, uh, actually refers to Jesus as the king of kings. It's almost like hmm, flaunting in the face of the emperor, who the real king of kings is. Uh, so Tiberius was quite a character. He was, um, he was the king at, at the time of Jesus' ministry and his, his crucifixion. So basically, it was under his, under his rule. Pontius Pilate was his governor in, in Jerusalem. He represented the emperor. Uh, and uh, Tiberius was the stepson of the emperor who was the emperor at the time of Jesus' birth, whose name was? That was the king. He was, he was the local Jew. Well, he was, you know, king of the Jews, <laughs> uh, Herod, the, the emperor of the Roman Empire. In the days of Caesar... Augustus, there you go. <laughs> Caesar Augustus went out a decree that all the world should be taxed. So this, so Caesar Augustus took a liking to Tiberius's mom. I think he had his actual father killed off so he could marry her. This is the kind of things these guys did. And, and so, so Tiberius was his stepson. And they were all quite odd. And, uh, well, you've heard the stories, I think, about Nero, the... the, the the guess is, maybe they actually know, that he, he, he was drinking out of too many lead containers let, that drove him crazy. I mean, they, they were crazy, they were proud, they were super arrogant, they, they ruled so much. So, for instance, uh, he, uh, this, is one, this is still the remains today of one of the estate's cottages. <laughs> it's like our McMa- new McMansions. Uh, that, that he had on the Isle of Capri. He had like 12 or 14 of them on this island. And all of them had dungeons and torture chambers and things like that, you know, just so he could emperor. I guess if he's the emperor, is that what he does? He emperors? No, empire? No, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so he, he, he was one odd dude, uh, was not a humble king, which reminds us of a whole lot of other kings down through the ages who probably you would not... Uh, uh, use the word humble with in the same breath, like Genghis Khan, how about him? You know, ruled over, established a huge empire over most tons of Asia through to China, uh, Eastern Europe, the whole, this hugely uh, powerful guy. Or Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, also had his, his European empire. Followed not that long ago in our memories to, uh, by Adolf Hitler, destructive, pompous, deluded, oh my gosh, humble, not one bit. Um, that's Stalin, uh, Joseph Stalin, who basically established the USSR with great uh, United S- the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics <laughs> with an iron fist, probably killed, had more people killed than Hitler had uh, so, so that he could rule with a rod, with, a, with an iron fist. And that's his current successor, who seems to think similarly, as far as I can tell. Um, here's another one. This is Hugo Chavez, who's, who's deceased now, but he was, back in 2004, when some of us went off to uh, Venezuela, he was actually the, uh, he was the dictator, I mean, the president of Venezuela. And he actually had just appointed his successor, who I think is in place now. So, and they've basically, because they don't care about people, I mean, this is why they're not humble. They don't care about the people. They care about themselves and lining their own pockets. 
And somehow this beautiful country that was super rich with oil is, is a total mess. And people are fleeing it by the tens of thousands have, have left Venezuela. Anyway, so not um, not, So in contrast to that, maybe this guy. <laughs> now I'm, you know, I'm not super pro-Catholic or anything. I just, I've, I've kind of enjoyed this guy. This is a, a Pope Francis. He's a, he's now 87, so he's probably slowing down. I'm not sure if he still does this kind of thing anymore. But in his early days, uh, he's been there. He's been uh, Pope for about 11 years. And uh, you know, there he is on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you know that's not overly pompous in my mind. You know, he, he's hanging out with the riffraff, the cardinals, <laughs> on the bus, and they seem to be having fun. You know, they seem to be laughing and enjoy, enjoying his company. So that's to me that's uh, add to that things like he would go into the city and and wash people's feet. This is uh, a typical Maundy Thursday. So I don't know if they're still doing it at St. George's, but. Um, a few years ago, there was Monday Thursday service, which is this week. So this week, uh, Good Friday is the fr- is the Friday that you know when Jesus was was crucified. But the night before is the night of his supper, and it's called Monday Thursday. And one of the things that we read in the Gospel of John on on the th- that night is that after the supper, he took he took off some of his garments, and he stripped down, got a towel, and he went around and washed the feet of all his disciples. Right. So some churches have established a bit of a tradition where on Monday, Thursday, they, they wash each other's feet too. And I, I've, I've participated in that at St. George's. And they stripped the whole altar. That's another story, yeah, which is quite effective. So, you know, so, so this, is, this is Pope Francis washing people's feet. And the, actually, these are, these are African immigrants or migrants uh, possibly fleeing from Africa. You've heard of the, there's a huge migration out of Africa because of the horrible situations down there. And a lot of them have taken boats. A lot of them have died in the process going across the Mediterranean and coming to places, especially to Italy. And, uh, you know, so, and, and they're Muslims. So Francis is washing the feet of some Muslim folks. Interesting. So there's some humility in that, I think. Um, so let's go back to our humble king, Jesus riding on that donkey uh, coming into Jerusalem, it's kind of coming through the portico there, uh, stylized idea of uh, coming into Jerusalem, people right waving the palm branches as you folk were doing. Looked pretty cool from up here, by the way. Um, and riding a donkey, how, that's pretty lowly and humble riding on a donkey? You know, there, there's two sides to that, yes and no. Well, it is yes, but uh, it might not seem so when I tell you the, this story. So first of all, I mean, there is a, there is a, um, a scripture from, I think it's Zechariah in the Old Testament that says, Behold, your king comes lowly and riding on a donkey. And one of, some of the Gospels refer to that when they talk about this uh, parade where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. But here's, here's the background story that the people, the, uh, Jesus' friends and the, his, uh, uh, the people of his day would understand. So back in the day of David, King David, uh, King David was getting old, and it was time f- for his successor to, to, to step in, for the next one to become king. You can read all this in your Hebrew scriptures. I th- I'll, I'm going to guess, because I didn't look it up, First Kings. <laughs> There's a lot of drama around the succession from, from, uh, from David to the next king. Because he had a whole lot of sons, he had a whole lot of wives. And they didn't get along, and they all wanted to be king. A whole bunch of them did anyway. One of them killed one of the other ones. Uh, and there was just this, this, all this drama. And so uh, David is basically sick and in bed. And they say, well, David, who's going to be the next king? And he promised Bathsheba that her son, Solomon, would be the next king. So that how are they going to show the people that, that he's to be king? So what they do, David says, well, get my donkey out and ride him around on my donkey through Jerusalem. And that's what they do. And everybody says, oh, now we know. <laughs> Solomon is, is the, the son of David who is the king. Now, back to Jesus' time, their word for Messiah, or the king, uh, the, 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 they were expecting, that they were anticipating, that they were hoping and praying for, was the son of David. Okay, And so, <laughs> Jesus, when he, comes, when he comes in on this donkey, is, is, is quite overtly intimating that he is the Messiah, and that he is their new king. How humble is that? 
<laughs> so that's just to give you the other side of the coin. But here's what I want to say about that. Um, it's, it is very humble because what is, what is humility? Here, let's get some insight into this. So I got, got this, this uh, reading from St. Vincent de Paul, another Catholic. <laughs> he, you know, there's a whole society of St. Vincent de Paul in the Catholic world that is you know, to, to help people who are poor or struggling. Um, and kind of like the Salvation Army, I guess, in, but, uh, in the Catholic world. And, and St. Vincent de Paul said this, humility is nothing but truth, and pride is nothing but lying. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty deep, pretty wise. Is it absolutely true? I don't know, but it's got a lot, of, a lot in it. Humility is nothing but truth, and pride is nothing but lying. And if there's one thing Jesus was all about, it was, uh, it was the truth. Over and over again, he emphasizes the truth. I was talking about this at uh, our service on Friday night. Um, Jesus said, uh, he, he said outrageous things outrageous things that would seem extremely proud unless they were true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. A lot of people have trouble with that statement. <laughs> it's so exclusive. Well, the reason it's exclusive is because Jesus is the way to the Father through the cross because we need forgiveness. But the, the point is it's true. He says it not, be, not to... to boost himself, but to let us know what we need to know for salvation, for, for, for healing of our souls, for, uh, for answers to our questions. Um, you know, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when he's coming into, into, into Jerusalem on the donkey saying, he's, he's overtly telling the people, I am the Messiah, that's good because he is the Messiah. <laughs> and that's what we need to hear. So you see my point? It's still humble. Because it's true. The opposite, pride is nothing but lying. Jesus says this about the devil. He says, the, he says, the devil is a liar and the father of lies. When he speaks, uh, he, he speaks lies, that's his native tongue. That's very insightful as well. So the enemy is, is full of pride, but also constantly lies. Uh, another quote from C.S. Lewis. I quoted him, I think, last week. But here he is again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Hmm. We have a, there's a common misconception that humility is putting yourself down, it's somehow, somehow demeaning yourself, or, or you know, kind of presenting yourself as, uh, as not worthy and you know, kind of less than who you are. That, that's not the scriptural idea at all, nor Jesus' idea. Um, I mean, w Scripture clearly teaches that we are, we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are wonderfully unique. We're all beautiful and amazing and marvelous. <laughs> we are. And, you know, we could almost get ourselves full of ourselves, so we have to be careful. <laughs> but, it, and, but humility is, is not thinking less of yourself. May, maybe, in, in truth, it might be sometimes thinking more of yourself, but it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. <laughs> In other words, thinking of other people more. So, which reminds me of the scripture which often is read today. I'm just going to go through it. Philippians 2, 3 to 11, where Paul writes to the church in Philippi about how they are to treat each other and how, you're, how the, the kind of the way that you can get along with each other. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Uh, now, so, some of the translations say, n n not looking only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Because you have to look to your own interests. But, but, but uh, in Christ, we're called to more and more looking to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same thinking as Christ Jesus. Uh, other translations say the same attitude or the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have this in you, which is in Christ. And this is a poem or a hymn, probably a hymn in the early church that Paul now quotes about Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. It's actually emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. Actually, the word is slave in the original Greek. Being made in human likeness, 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So we have this depiction of, uh, of the humiliation of Christ. He, he, first, he ta- he's God. He takes human form. He, he, uh, he, 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 just, does, he just serves, or he, he's a slave to others. Then he, he humbles himself and becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross, because that is like the most shameful of deaths. Utter humiliation. In the next line, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I mean, that's the king part. If the first previous line, you know, the humiliation is the humble part. This is the king part. So, yeah. Now, we're being taught by these scriptures that Jesus is humble, which means that God is humble. In fact, God is absolutely humble. And that's, therein lies the rub, the problem. A God who is absolutely humble, and he is by definition, (laughs) is invisible to a humanity so infected with pride. And we, we, are, we are a race of those who are, each and every one of us, infected, I like this word, with pride. Uh, and he is invisible. People say, well, where's God? I don't see any God. I, there's no indication of God. You know? Well, we, they can't see him because he never, he never pushes himself on us. You know, he's hidden because you know, he, 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 he stays in the background. He does not assert his own way. He does not insist on his own way. He is hidden, although he is apparent in all creation. Is he not? <laughs> so I, I have a few examples of that just to keep a second. <laughs> you know, uh, to me, just it's just so obvious as the nose on your face that there is a God. Uh, and Paul, Paul writes this in Romans 1. He says, uh, the, the things about God, namely his eternal power and, and deity, are clearly perceived in the things that have been made, in other words, in the things that have been created. I mean, we, we are just saturated with beauty around us, the wonder of creation, um, from the smallest little creatures, and uh, uh, don't get me started. What about these guys? Like, who would have thunk that up? <laughs> beauty, the greenery, so, I mean, the vegetation and the, and the, the wondrous creatures that still remain, we've, we've killed off a lot of them, but these ones are still going. Beautiful. And of course, ironically, the highest of his creation made in the image and likeness of God. Human beings, right? We are, the psalmist says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And he is revealed through his word, too. I mean, this, this book is a marvelous thing. It's an amazing thing. It's the most, uh, the, the most sold book in, all, in history by, by far, 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 by a long shot. And it's in more languages than any other book in the, in all of, on, in, on the earth. And partly because we, we, we Christians have been translating it <laughs> into all these languages. Missionaries have gone to places where they didn't even have written languages. And they would learn their, the oral language in order that they could write it down, in order that they could put the Bible in people's languages so they could read it for themselves. But it's full, chock full of the truth about God and his great love and his humility and, uh, you know, his power and his, his plan to save us, and rescue us and restore us. Uh, and, and Jesus himself, has, in, the, in the scriptures, we read the Gospels, we get the story of this humble man. There he is. This is like the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaching. Remember, remember I said, you know, humility is all about truth. Jesus just constantly laid out truth for people, told them truth. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed are those who mourn, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all through, all through his teachings. There he is. Uh, this is the, the night where he, he, uh, before he died, when he, uh, he washed the disciples' feet. It's great humility, being a servant. This is him touching a leper. Nobody touched lepers. They were unclean. And the guy says, you know, if you will, you can make me whole. Jesus said, I will. And he reached out and touched him and made him and cleansed him. And, of course, the ultimate, laying down his life for the rest of us. 
Greater love has no one than this, that one lays down their life for their friends, Jesus says. And you're my friends, he says. And when everybody had abandoned him and he was dying for us, um, he just said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> it's mind-boggling, really. It really is. What a, uh, our world doesn't get this because our world admires power and wealth and prestige and influence and forcefulness and aggressiveness. We're impressed by that sort of thing and pride. And Jesus' way looks like weakness. It w looks like weakness. And it is weakness from the world's perspective. I mean, we, we, are, we are simple, uh, needy people who require a Savior. We are weak. And God, it, it, God's way looks like weakness. But, but it's funny because uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And the, and the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Anyway, it looks like wisdom, or it looks like weakness, rather, to, uh, to the world, this way of Jesus. But you know, th this is the parable Jesus tells about uh, these two guys went up to the temple to pray. The guy in the background, uh, I can see here, maybe this guy back here, he's a tax collector. And he's back there beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the guy at the front, the Pharisee, says, thank God I'm not like these other people, especially that guy. I've got a, a quote from a Father Longenecker on pride. At its heart, pride is the attitude that I have done nothing wrong and that there is nothing to apologize for. A proud person believes himself or, the, himself or herself to be okay. They honestly see themselves as good and righteous and not in need of help. A self-sufficient person is proud. A self-righteous self person is proud. Anyone who believes themselves right and good is proud. The proud person is pictured in the gospel by the person who says, I thank you, God, that I am not like that sinner over there. I think that's very telling. So, how do we follow Jesus? How do we get humble? <laughs> that's the big million-dollar question, because it's not native to many of us, say maybe all of us, um, and so, what is the answer? Well, God, God, only God can work that into us. But all the steps that we take require humility. They, 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 they bring us into humility. To, to believe the simple gospel, that's offensive to a lot of people in our world. You know, <laughs> to, you know I, mean? I, I, I can't do it myself? No. You've got to put your trust in Jesus. A little child can get, get it. You know? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life takes humility. We look to the Word of God to teach and shape us. In other words, we say, okay, I, I, I don't know myself. I'm not that wise. I need, I need some, some instruction here. It takes a little bit of humility to, say, to, to submit ourselves to the authority of God's Word, where He tells us about ourselves and tells us, you know, about Christ. It tells us, uh, you know, about right and wrong. It's all there. If we accept that the Holy Spirit is shining light on our thoughts, our ways, and our attitudes. And he is. Every one of us is getting the Holy Spirit shining light on your, your soul, your spirit, your mind, your thoughts, your feelings. I'm trying to talk to you. <laughs> Gently nudging. Easy to ignore. But if we pay attention and cooperate, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll teach us the ways of Christ. And therefore, if Christ is being formed in us, and that's the whole thing. The nature of Christ is being formed in us when all that stuff is happening. And that nature is humility. Because Christ is humble. We are not. And as he's formed in us, we become more and more so. May we stay the course.